Well, welcome. We're very excited to be sharing with you to, today what we think is some really cutting-edge work in ecological farming methods and, and uh, crop nutrition out of Europe. We learned about the work of uh, the next speaker through Arden Anderson, who was visiting and consulting with growers over there, and he was impressed, and we are too. We have a slight substitute. Uh, Mr. Smits was unable to uh, come to the conference from Holland for some, some health reasons. Uh, he's doing well, but we'll, we miss him. But his partner, Johan Timmermans, is filling in, and he works with him in the company and will explain to you what they're doing in Holland regarding advanced plant tissue testing and nutrition management. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Fred, for uh, having me here. Um, I'm Johan Timmermans. I work as a manager and as a crop consultant at um, Nova Crop Control in the Netherlands. Um, I'll have a first, first a short introduction of who I am and what we do. Uh, we are independent crop consulting of consultants, so we don't sell any fertilizers. We just uh, growers will just hire us to give uh, an independent advice on mo mainly fertilization and uh, plant health. Um, to do a proper uh, consulting, um, we worked with uh, plant sap testing with those little uh, Cardi kits, um, like uh, here on the, in the booth uh, I showed, uh, for like 10 years already. Um, and we learned a lot of it, but we gained more and more questions um, by doing more and more analysis. So that's what, when we decided in 2008 to start a laboratory, um, to also be able to um, analyze uh, trace elements, uh, magnesium levels, calcium levels, sulfur levels, all 22 elements, of 20 elements actually. We are active in uh, 200 different crops. I didn't knew that uh, for last month until I uh, started counting them. I didn't even, there were 200 different, diff different kind of crops, but uh, our main uh, crops are fruit uh, production, um, vegetable production, so like potatoes and, and um, uh, carrots and that, those kinds of stuff. And our vegetables indoors uh, in greenhouses like tomatoes, uh, peppers, cucumbers, um, <coughs> and uh, a lot of nursery crops, so uh, flowers, flower bulbs, because we're from the Netherlands, and um, cutting flowers, trees, large trees, um, municipal trees as well. We work uh, uh, in 15, uh, more than 15 countries, as well as here in the States and in, uh, in Canada. Um, our goal was, of our, we aimed um, to, um, because we work in the plant sap, we want to uh, adjust fertilization very quickly after uh, seeing some problems. So we wanted the results be ready within 24 hours after taking the samples. So that was one of the, um, the goals we have within the laboratory. It, must, uh, it, it has to be uh, quick, uh, cost-effective, and uh, accurate. Um, and for the rest, we do some independent research for fertilization companies who want to test their fertilizers, um, but also growers who want to test if a fertilizer they want to buy or did already buy to, um, to see if they really need it. And we, um, we teach some study groups um, more and more about uh, fertilization, how to optimize or balance their soils, but also balance mineral uptake. <coughs> so uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today is mineral uptake. Um, all the speakers uh, here at the conference talk about healthy soils, uh, balancing soils on minerals, biology, uh, structure. Um, the final result of all processes in the soil, yeah, of fertilization or the, 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 the tillages you do, the type of uh, plants or the type of soil uh, rotation, whatever, it all, uh, the final results will, um, will be, uh, okay, you can see them in, in, your, in the plant, uptake of minerals. So that's why we look at the plant. We start with uh, balancing the soil in spring and in winter, and then um, that's still no guarantee for a balanced uptake throughout the season. Uh, because you have drought, or you, had, you, had, uh, you have um, uh, a lot of rain, or you have to uh, warm temperatures, cold temperatures. Everything is, has an influence on the uptake of minerals. And you simply can't uh, feed the plant in springtime, or in, in, in early spring, or in winter, for the entire year. And we can't eat for an entire week as well. 
of neither. <clears throat> Every sample gets about 20 parameters, so it's like the, the bricks levels, sugar levels we measure, uh, pH, conductivity, and then all nutrients we can, uh, we can man man uh, measure. So that's calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium levels, uh, three different kinds of, uh, of nitrogen. I'll come back to that later. Uh, phosphorus, chloride, sulfur, and all trace elements. <clears throat> so what's different with a conventional um, tissue test based on dry matter analysis? What we um, analyze is like the blood of a, uh, in, your, in your arm or in your, in your body, uh, the blood of a plant. That's what we test. So not what a, what a plant already uh, took up the last few months, but what he has available for his growth or his uh, production or his um, uh, whatever he's doing at that moment, if he's producing fruit or, if he, or, or he's, he's, he's growing in, 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 in height or whatever, um, the energy he's, he needs for that, that's what we measure at that moment. <clears throat> we want to make uh, mineral deficiencies uh, or excesses visible before uh, you can see them on the plant, before they become visible at, uh, on, the, on your leaves, for example. It reflects the nutri nutrient imbalances in the soil. If your base saturation is out of, uh, out of balance, that, that will reflect the mineral uptake of your plants, of course. So you can see that in your sap analysis. It gives an overview of your plant reserves. We'll come back to that later on, how that, how that works. Um, <clears throat> so basically, the nutrients which the plant is able to use at, for its growth or development at that moment, that's what we measure. And a, dry, a conventional dry matter analysis is just a test of what's total in that leaf or in the plant. So not what he's, he's able to use at that moment for its growth. So that's a big difference. <clears throat> it reflects plant health and, um, and vitality. I have some sheets on that later on uh, about aphids or uh, mildew, those kinds of diseases, which have a very close connection with uh, nutrition. Um, how you can improve fruit quality with um, balancing the, the, the nutrients. Um, and as I said, it's like a blood analysis of, uh, of a plant. <coughs> um, all samples start with sampling, of course. Um, proper sampling is, is, is necessary for, uh, for goods, um, for proper uh, numbers. We have manuals for all kinds of different uh, of crops, of course. You can check our website for that. Then a, a thing we, we always measure, is this working? Yeah. We measure young and old leaves separately. I'll come back to that later, why we do that. Uh, but it has to do with the reserves in the plant, the storage of, um, of for example, potassium is in, in the older leaves. And, and when numbers in older leaves will drop, you notice that the plant is, um, is taking itself uh, of sucking all, all this energy out of its older leaves and put it in into the younger leaves, for example. Come, to back, come, to the, come back to that uh, later on. You want to try to sample in the morning. Then the leaves are on, on, uh, on the best tension. Uh, all uh, nutrients and sugars are redirected um, from, from the upper leaves to, to the entire plant. That the gives the best overview of, of, of the plant at that moment. Try to sample poor plants versus good plants. So you learn, you learn the most... Um, you learn the most of, of the analysis, of course. We analyze leaves uh, and cut off the petioles because the petioles contain different levels than, than the leaves, uh, the, as the leaves themselves. Um, if you're going to mix them up, you don't know what the petioles contain and you don't know what the leaves contain. So we decided to just sample the leaves. You want to avoid uh, rain or dew on the samples because it will dilute your, uh, your, your sample, of course. And you want to avoid evaporation of the sample. So we try to, to pack them in those uh, Ziploc bags and then push the air out against your belly or whatever. And then that's the best way to send in samples. Because if there's air in, in, the, in the bags, there's space for evaporation of the, of the leaves. <clears throat> and you'll have a, a wrong, um, of an error on your samples. There are different <coughs> factors which determine mineral uptake. You already uh, heard a lot of them um, from the other speakers, of course, for the other presenters. 
Uh, I've not, uh, noted some, uh, some here. Uh, for example, the pH of the soil. I hear a lot of growers here who, who have to deal with a, with a high pH, so 7 or even higher. When we see a, a soil pH of about 7, then we automatically know that we have troubles with the uptake of almost all trace elements, iron, manganese, uh, zinc. They will all be uh, blocked by the high pH. So that's, that's one, of the, one of the things which is really important for mineral uptake, mineral availability. <coughs> also the pH of the irrigation water. If you use a lot of irrigation water with high, high pHs, uh, a lot of bicarbonates, then you're, you're, you're binding your, your trace elements in the soil. And the plant can't pick them up, can't take them up. Further, the, the imbalance in minerals, uh, if you have the base saturation for, for regarding the, the Albrecht uh, method, um, it always has to be in balance. If you have excesses in calcium or in magnesium or in potassium, that will, affect the, will, will um, negatively affect the, the uptake of minerals. Come back to that later on. Then you have the release of fertilizers. The moment when you put on your fertilization or your fertilizer and the moment it gets released or, or it gets available for the plant. There's always a time frame in that. If you have artificial fertilizers, then it's ready, dissolvable, uh, easy dissolvable sol salts and will be um, available for the plants very quickly. If you use compost, for example, it will take a bit longer. You, you need mineralization. So the moment of application versus plant availability, that's a factor you have to take in mind. <coughs> we have some growers who, um, who use potassium fertilizers in, uh, in the winter for the entire year. You can't do that because potassium is easily leachable. And if you have some heavy rain in spring, you're going to have a shortage in potassium in, in the summer, for example. So take that in mind. Then soil structure, root quality, really important. If you don't have any roots, then uh, you don't have any mineral uptake. So that minerals need to be, of, has to, has to come in the plant by the, the roots. So the more roots you have, the better it is, basically. Uh, and then the root quality, so the, the, the really nice, fine root hairs um, are, are uh, really important for calcium uptake, for example. Then a really important factor is soil life. I'm not going to talk about soil life uh, because other, other presenters will do that uh, far more better than I can. Um, and that's a course for two days as well, <laughs> alone. But then a thing we don't or we can't measure or manage uh, really, really good is the climate. So the temperature, light, um, moisture of the soil, um, it all has its influence on the uptake of minerals. And then it says, etc., etc., etc. That says there are a bunch of a lot of reasons why a plant uh, didn't or did uh, take up uh, the mineral at that time. So that's why we're going to look in the plant. So what actually happened? Looking into the plant will show the final result of all the above factors. What's really happening? What's feeling? What the plant is feeling at that moment? This is a uh, corn plant, for example, or a uh, wheat plant or whatever. Um, it shows where in a plant a deficiency first, uh, first comes uh, visible. Here at the bottom, you have those, those elements you, you probably all, all, all of you know. It's the nitrogen, the, the potassium, magnesium, phosphorus. If you have a deficiency of, for example, magnesium, you'll first see that in the older leaves. That's why it's on the bottom of this, this plant. <coughs> it has to do with uh, mobility, mobilization of, of the mineral. If you imagine some roots here under this picture, and the magnesium availability will be uh, shut down, for example. Doesn't mean which reason, but the, 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 the uptake of, of magnesium will be, um, will be decreased. Then the plant still needs magnesium for its younger parts, for example. It will pull out the magnesium from its older leaves, and then it will transport it up to the stem to the younger leaves to feed its younger leaves. <coughs> if you look at calcium, for example, that's on the top of a, of a plant. So if you have a calcium deficiency, you'll always see that in the younger parts or in the fruit. That, that also means that when the calcium uptake shuts down, 
of is shut down. A plant is not able to, to pull calcium out of its older leaves to feed, it, to feed its younger leaves. So that's why you see, the, you see the shortage of calcium, the deficiency, in the younger parts of the plant. Boron as well. For, <clears throat> so when the roots can't deliver uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium or magnesium, it will use its reserves from its older leaves. That's why, that's one of the reasons we sample uh, young leaves separately from older leaves. And because we look into the, 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 the sap of the plant, so the mobile uh, nutrients, you can, you can compare these, these numbers with these numbers. Uh, and then um, if the numbers of the older leaves drop below the numbers of the younger leaves, then you know the plant has taken its own storage of its own reserves. And then you know that's your moment. You have to apply extra, now let's say, potassium or phosphorus or magnesium, whatever uh, element is, is lacking. So the older leaves are the storehouse for the mobile elements, and the, those mobile elements are the NPK and the magnesium. <clears throat> when there's coming fruit on a plant, I try to, to draw that, but... Um, when fruit starts to develop, in general, potassium needs uh, will be higher. The plant needs more potassium to fill the fruit. First, the fruit first needs uh, calcium, but to build uh, size, it needs potassium as well. <coughs> potassium in the old leaves, when there, when there, when there starts coming fruit, um, potassium in the old leaves uh, will be mobilized and transported to the younger parts, because the plant still wants to grow and also to the fruit, to determine fruit quality, fruit firmness, for example. So deficiencies of those mobile elements will occur first in the older leaves, in the older parts, especially when there's, uh, there's a lot of fruit on a plant. Uh, most plants can't keep up with the uptake, for example, potassium. And you see the numbers drop very, very fast. Here's an example of a potato crop. <coughs> Sorry that this is in uh, this is in Dutch, but uh, I'll, I'll try to explain. <laughs> um, if you look at this plant, the deficiency shows itself first in the older leaves, like this. And if you look at the plant sap test, you see this is the younger leaf, the younger part, and this is the older part, the dark green. You see the the values of the older leaves drop below the younger leaves, and that's why that's when we know the plant is eating itself and using all the magnesium from its older leaves to feed the younger leaves. But they are still too low. I'd rather have them over here, both. So that's the main reason why we sample young and old leaves separately. And by young and old leaves, we mean young but still fully, growth, uh, fully grown, so it has uh, reasonable size. And the oldest, but still vital leaves. Uh, at the end of the season, those old leaves will turn yellow. And you don't want to sample yellow leaves, but, uh, because then you're, you're fooling yourself. Because values will, will probably even, even be higher in there. But just because the plant is, is, is pulling all the moisture out of it, and it doesn't benefit anymore for photosynthesis. So the, the, the leaf still must be um, vital. It's the same for a corn crop, the same for a potato crop. Works the same in every kind of crop. That's, that, that's what makes, makes this technique so unique and, and um, fit for every crop. Then there are some antagonistic interactions in the soil, but also in the plant, in the plant sap. It's all about balance. If you look at cation, cation balance, um, you have, uh, it's like a balance, uh, a seesaw, as if I translate that right. Um, it's potassium, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and ammonium, which are all positively charged. And if one is high, if one is raised, the, the one of another will be uh, reduced in the uptake or in the plant itself. So at the end, it's the balance uh, what counts for the uptake. Try to keep the tractor <laughs> a bit straight. <coughs> for, the, 
for example, if you're uh, going to apply a lot of potassium and the plant takes up potassium, so the, the sap in the plant will contain more and more potassium, you know automatically you'll have a reduction in the uptake of, for example, calcium and magnesium and a bit of sodium, but we don't mind low sodium levels. We do mind low calcium and magnesium levels because those are the building blocks for, your, for, your, for a healthy crop. So when one of those elements uh, is, is increases or is increased, uh, one or more will decrease in, in, the, in the plant sap, in the uptake. So always take that in mind and use that as a tool to apply fertilization or fertilizers at the right moment. So don't apply really easy available potassium right after or right before planting, for example. Because in the, in the first stage of the growth, you need more calcium and more magnesium than you need uh, potassium. You need the potassium later on when the fruit starts to grow or when the potato starts to, uh, to fill. Um, one of the reasons uh, high potassium will, um, will be working antagonistic on, uh, for example, calcium and magnesium levels is high applications of animal manure or high applications of compost. If you apply a lot of manure or a lot of compost, potassium availability will raise, will raise or will raise uh, explosive especially when you get uh, some really nice warm soil, so the mineralization will, will go very fast, you get excesses of potassium. We see that quite often in our uh, fruit crops, for example. The high potassium uptake will reduce your magnesium and calcium uptake right away. Potassium gets in the plant very easily. Calcium and magnesium um, is far, far harder for the plant to take, uh, to take them up. It will decrease your plant growth at the beginning of the first stage of the growth. And you will have, at the end, you will have smaller fruit and misshapen fruit, for example. We see that in strawberries very, very close. So the advice is apply manure or compost not only based on organic matter or soil life. It's not, compost is not just soil life or not just organic matter. It also contains a lot of nutrients. And you have to take that in mind, especially uh, potassium or if you have a poor compost, sodium levels can, can be pretty high as well. See here a picture what high sodium in compost uh, can do. You don't have a plant left. So plants need very little sodium. They do need some, but very little, not, not, not in the amounts as, as we talk about potassium or calcium or magnesium, just, just a little bit. And sodium is very easy obtainable, so they, you just have to apply really small amounts, and most soils contain enough sodium, so you don't have to apply any. So all the sodium is, is um, take, the plant takes up all the sodium very easily, and it blocks up the, the calcium uptake and magnesium very fast. We see some problems with water quality. So if you have a really balanced soil and you're going to pour on irrigation water with a lot of sodium, you're still going to wreck out all the, bells, the calcium balancing you've done the winter before. And we see a lot of ballast, ballast um, with fertilizers. For example, poor compost can contain a lot of sodium. And you're doing more uh, wrong than you're doing right with, with your compost. <clears throat> if we look at the other side of the, of the line, the anions, um, it's some sort of same uh, balance. So we have nitrogen, chloride, phosphorus, and sulfur. If one is high, it will reduce the uptake of another one. Um, so that's one of, the <clears throat> one of the reasons when you have high phosphorus levels, you will have more troubles with the, uh, with the uptake of sulfur, for example, or for the, with the uptake of nitrates. If you can reduce nitrates, so turn the balance the other side around, then it will result in a better uptake of phosphorus. And I understood you had more problems with uh, phosphorus uptake here than with nitrates. So if you get, if you're able to, to, to lower your nitrate inputs, you will automatically have a plus on your phosphorus uptake without applying any extra phosphorus. Another thing we see is, is you have the muriate of potash, the, the, the potassium chloride, um, and you use a lot of it. <coughs> I assume you don't use it all because you're almost all organic, but um, 
when you do, of your neighbor, <laughs> your neighbor will, um, you will reduce your uptake of nitrogen or phosphorus of sulfur right away because of the chloride, it will kick out the other elements on, on the balance. And that can go very fast. <coughs> if we look at the plant sap test and uh, fruit quality, for example, then I often compare, uh, for example, uh, a tomato or a strawberry of whatever fruit, I compare it with a tire of a car. Calcium is the rubber, the quality of the rubber, and we got to pump it up with, uh, with potassium. If you don't have proper calcium in, in, as on, on, on the basis, you can't make size on your fruit or it will burst. So it's the potassium to calcium ratio, which is really important for the fruit quality, and then I'll talk about fir uh, firmness and size. It's always a balance between potassium and calcium. If you're high in potassium, you also need to be higher in calcium to have the same quality. And that's what's, what goes wrong very often. That they heard um, uh, potassium is needed for, for the firmness of, of fruit. That is so. But if my calcium is low, I don't need that much of potassium because I easily overdo it. So it's the ratio between potassium and calcium in the fruit which determines the firmness and the size. If one is high, the other one should also be a bit higher. <coughs> I've illustrated that as a, on an example of a strawberry crop, but it, it, it counts for every crop we've, we've uh, checked uh, the last few years. Um, if you divide the growing season in two parts, the vegetative, vegetative phase, and, um, which is uh, for plant growth, so building a factory, actually, making leaves, um, we prefer more uptake of calcium and magnesium and a bit lower uptake of uh, potassium is needed. I don't say you don't need any potassium, but we need less. And then the second phase, when there was fruit on the crops or there was potatoes under the, under the crop, for example, then the demand for potassium um, will grow. You need more and more potassium for setting and filling of the fruit. This graph shows the production, so uh, how much strawberries they pick in a week uh, after planting. When the, pl when the, when the, the plants are uh, planted, it's, uh, there's no fruit on it, of course, after several weeks. And this is a, from a greenhouse crop, so it's like six, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, six and a half weeks, they start picking the first strawberries. And then... It, really, it raises very fast, the production, so the kilograms or, or pounds of strawberries on that, uh, on that crop raises very fast, and then it drops a bit the, the weeks after that. If you then compare the potassium needs for that crop, it goes quite along with this, with this curve, but then it starts a few weeks earlier, of course, but it also does, does have this, this line. So when there's more fruit on the plant, potassium uptake has to be increased, but still not too much. So, and if you then look at your SEP test, you're going to compare younger leaves with older leaves and then take in mind that your plant reserves are in the older leaves, especially for the potassium. So all the leaves are the storage for the younger leaves and the fruit. So when, if you look at this picture, this is the moment when the plant is going to use the potassium from its older leaves, for example. And at a certain point, the, the values in the SEP analysis from the old leaves will drop below the younger leaves. And if they're a bit lower, that's not a problem. But if they're going to be too, too low, then um, your plant starts to, um, to become potassium deficiency. And then you see analysis like this. The younger leaves are still okay, like 5,000 ppms of potassium. And the older leaves is, is like 3,400 um, 3, ppms. That will that absolutely seen it. That's still enough. But if you compare it with the younger leaves, the plant is eating itself. And if you if you see this kind of edges on your leaves, then that's almost always potassium deficiency. <coughs> I 
Ah, but I mean strawberry in Dutch. <laughs> so <clears throat> I tried to make some uh, translations, but um, this is the same strawberry crop. <clears throat> the yellow line is the, um, the younger leaves, the potassium levels, and the, other, the red line is the sap levels of potassium in the older leaves. In the starting of the growth, we see that the older leaves, the numbers in the older leaves are higher than in, in the younger leaves. That means the plant is full of reserves. It has, it contains enough potassium at that moment. When tillage goes along, or weeks goes along, the fruit starts to, um, starts to develop. And at a certain, certain point, the old leaves will be sucked empty. Younger leaves still remain at the same same level, and it starts to use its own storage. So levels in the old leaves will drop. And at a certain point, the difference between young and old leaves, so the storage, is empty. You can't get any more out of it. So at that time, fruit problems started. So what you have to, to, to try to avoid is, and, and have to do is apply, in this case, extra potassium at this moment to prevent that the old leaf will be will be dead empty. If you apply potassium too early, you will have outcompete your uh, your calcium and magnesium in the first growing stage. If you apply it too late, the fruit can't benefit any more from it, and you lose quality. So soft fruit and also poor shelf life and poor taste. So. You're going to build fruit and build quality of the fruit with calcium on the basis, and you have to, or you can pump it up with potassium, but you make sure you don't let it pop. Like this tomato, it just burst open because of low calcium and high potassium. So it's the ratio which is out of balance. And then the tire, you run on flat tires. Mineral uptake and uh, plant disease. We see a very close relationship between nutrition of plants and uh, the appearance of diseases in plants. It's the same to us as humans. If we don't eat properly, we don't eat healthy, we're going to get sick earlier, or sick more easily. It works the same for plants. So balancing mineral uptake will give a balanced growth, a constant growth. So no excesses in growth or no... Um, reduced growth, an even growth. If you have balanced your mineral uptake, your plant will be less receptive for diseases. And then we, we see strong relationships with aphids, uh, fungal diseases, fungal attacks like mildew, botrytis, um, also phytophthora, uh, and also bacterial diseases. Uh, you'll have better flower quality if you balance your mineral uptake, uh, and also fruit quality can be improved. So like shelf life, firmness, but most important, taste. A lot of those relationships between minerals of nutrients and uh, plant diseases is, are shown in this, uh, this book, Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease. I don't know if it's available at uh, the bookstore, but um, otherwise you probably can, can, um, can find it on the Internet. But it shows a lot of relationships between specific elements and the appearance of diseases. This is a strawberry crop uh, propagation. So they, they make plants for uh, strawberry production. This was one field. <coughs> this picture taken that one, that side. This picture taken the other side. The, the, the guy who took the picture was actually sure to should have stand here, but <laughs> who took the, he took the picture. And um, one side of the field was covered with mildew, and the other side didn't. The only difference was a difference in variety. So they had the same fertilization, same soil, um, same soil type, um, same watering, same um, herbicide program, for, uh, same pesticide program. This was a conventional grower. One variety showed mildew, and the other one didn't. Here's a close-up uh, picture. This is typical for mildew in strawberries. It's the leaves which curl up. Um, and that's typical mildew. So we checked uh, at that moment. We checked the, the plant sap of, of both um, both sides of the field and both varieties. So <clears throat> the main difference was silica. 
the element silica is, is involved in uh, cell strength, uh, hardness of the cell wall. So if your plant contains enough silica, it will automatically be more resistant against fungal diseases, for example, like mildew. At that moment, we start to apply silica to also get the other variety, the red one, um, at the same levels as, uh, as the other one, and the mildew disappeared. Another relationship we strongly, of a strong relationship we often see is uh, nitrogen and aphids, the pressure of aphids. Uh, a plant can take up nitrogen in, for example, a nitrate form or an ammonium form. <clears throat> Once the nitrates are, uh, are taken up by the plant, it needs to be converted into amino acids and later on in proteins. And that's the nitrogen you want in your plants. It's not the nitrates, not the nitrates, it's the amino acids and proteins. That's the, the form of nitrate you want, of nitrogen you want. Sorry. What we often see is that, uh, that the conversion, um, that's the factor which is lacking. So you get accumulation of nitrates, and that will stimulate insect attacks and fungal diseases. You see that quite often. So high nitri nitrates will give luxurious, luxurious growth. Sorry, <laughs> can't pronounce that properly. Um, <coughs> It will give you large but weaker cells, so a lot of moisture in, in large cells will make them very weak. You will see low bricks levels, low sugar production, so the plant is very sensitive for uh, attack of, of insects like uh, aphids. So the key is to keep nitrate accumulation very low, and um, you have to convert them eff efficiently in amino acids and proteins. <coughs> And there's one way, or there are several ways to do that, to stimulate that, and that's to optimize photosynthesis for one reason. You can do that with manganese, of optimizing levels of manganese, uh, magnesium, iron, zinc. Those trace elements who make your leaves green, then you will optimize your photosynthesis. Every leaf what looks pale or yellow doesn't uh, do the photosynthesis process properly. Also, molybdenum is an element which is important for the conversion of nitrates. And then, of course, biology. Biology and soil life, those, those microorganisms are really efficient in uh, converting um, nitrates. <coughs> so, with our SEP testing, we can monitor that nitrate conversion. Um, so we test the sap on nitrate, ammonium, and we, we test the total, total nitrogen. So when we take those numbers from each other, they, we, we uh, calculate it, then we have a number of converted nitrogen. I have an example for that. <coughs> this is a, a sweet pepper uh, crop in the greenhouse, in glass house in the Netherlands, organic. <coughs> so grown in, in, the, in the full soil, not on a substrate. The test showed total nitrogen was 2,500 ppms. The nitrate was like 1,100 ppms. That's quite high for a pepper crop. The converted N is the difference between those two numbers. So if you cal calculate the nitrate conversion, you're going to divide the 1,100 of nitrates by the 2,500 of total nitrogen, then 44% of the nitri nitrogen in that plant is in the nitrate form, and that's quite high. In this greenhouse, we saw the numbers go above 55%. So 55% of the nitrogen in the plant was in the nitrate form. That was exact, exactly the moment the aphids came in, and the entire crop was gone. They have to harvest the entire crop and uh, plant new ones of another crop uh, after that. So the entire crop was gone. So what we did over there was uh, we decreased the amount of uh, fertilizer, uh, nitrogen fertilization. Um, they are used to, um, to apply huge amounts of compost, like um, one or two inches every year, because compost is kind of cheaper in our country. And they think the more compost, the better. But the nutrients uh, went out of whack, twice, three times as high as conventional growths. So we decreased the amount of, of nitrogen in the program. We increased magnesium, manganese, iron, and zinc to make the photosynthesis more efficiently. So the conversion of nitrates into 
amino acids and proteins. And we stimulated the soil life not with compost, but with compost teas. So we inoculated some biology there. And the next year, they had a better crop. And the year after that, um, it even get better uh, every year without applying any basic fertilization in spring of before planting. <coughs> so and that's all based on optimizing uh, the photosynthesis process. This is a very simplified picture, um, but it's mainly um, <coughs> catching sunlight and convert that energy into um, the energy a plant can use for its own functioning. So <coughs> the plant takes up or picks up the sunlight in, on the leaves. That's why leaves are, are um, positioned this way, not this way. So that's also a sign if your leaves are hanging, they can't take up enough sunlight. They breathe in carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen. That's why we need plants for our um, needs, for the oxygen, of course. And then there's an uptake of water to the leaves and nutrients, and they are converted and put back in, uh, in energy packages or other nutrients which are already converted. That's simplified what happens with uh, photosynthesis. We are constantly managing this process, optimizing this process. So we want to manage the leaves as a factory of energy, energy factories. And you can only do that to, by keeping your leaves green. And with, with green, I mean uh, not the dark green from uh, packed with nitrates, but um, a healthy green. That's what I mean. So avoid these situations with deficiencies. Because every leaf which shows a deficiency, a chlorosis or a necrosis, it won't um, contribute to, um, to the photosynthesis process efficiently. And that's mainly based on this element. If you, if you tear down a leaf or uh, the green pigment of a leaf, <coughs> you've got four parts of nitrogen and one part of magnesium. Now, we already know that when I apply nitrogen, the leaves get greener. That's a normal uh, reaction. But often nitrates of nitrogen is, is already at a good level. And then magnesium, for example, is lacking. And then you need magnesium to make this balance right and the plants start growing again without applying any nitrogen at all. <coughs> we saw that on this uh, strawberry crop. It's also a propagation field. Um, it's covered on plastic, and they have a uh, tea tape underneath it, so they can apply water and nutrients. Uh, the entire field uh, showed uh, high nitrate numbers, high nitrogen numbers, very sufficient levels, but the plant growth won't start growing. It was packed with nitrogen up here, but it won't start developing itself, it won't start growing. It, won't make, it wouldn't make these, uh, these new shoots, which are actually the new plants, which the grower uh, wants to sell. So we started treating um, magnesium over there because the soil contains a base saturation of 92% calcium, 6% magnesium, and it's a really low uh, organic matter. That's, uh, this, this used to be uh, sea le um, the, uh, on the sea bottom, bottom of the sea. We, uh, in the Netherlands, we, uh, <laughs> we have a hobby to... Uh, to pump out the sea and make new land out of it. <laughs> and then try to grow a crop on it. <coughs> um, so that's, uh, that's the basic of this soil. It's high calcium, very low magnesium. Um, so we already knew magnesium will be deficient constantly. Uh, the balance will always be held up by calcium and the magnesium will always be low. <coughs> so we started giving magnesium. In this case, we had a, an organic... Uh, magnesium carbonate in a, in a liquid form, so we can we could apply it with the the T tape system and uh, right at the roots, so where it's needed at that moment. Uh, we can't we can't balance the whole the whole whole soil with magnesium uh, because it's too expensive um, and there's such uh, such amount of calcium in it that it will constantly uh, put away the magnesium uptake. It will block it. So we only needed 10 liters, but right at the point where it's needed. And the row on the right, 
the grower was a bit of uh, stubborn <laughs> and uh, didn't use uh, the right uh, row. And within five days, the plant starts to convert all the, the high nitrogen levels into growth, so into amino acids, proteins, and endly growth. So it starts to make new shoots within five days. So it, wasn't, it was a magnesium effect, and it looked like nitrogen. <clears throat> Another example, uh, how we used the, the SEP testing, was at six potato fields. It was uh, potatoes for uh, the chips uh, industry. Um, it was in the north part of the Netherlands, and it was just a comparison uh, between different growers or different fields and different fertilization strategies. Uh, this is Dutch, you can't read it, you don't have to. Um, just going to talk about the colors. This is the, the connectivity of the, of the plant sap that gives an, an idea of the total amount of nutrition in the plant. It just is a number of the plant is, is having enough nutrition or it's lacking nutrition, nothing more or less than that. The green lines were the same, uh, same grower. Um, are really huge, of really high in, 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 in nutrition. The red one is really low. Nothing more, nothing less information about that. The other ones, the blue one and the yellow one, were somewhere in the middle. Normally, it's about 10 or 11. 15 is far too high. But <clears throat> then we're going to look at which nutrient is causing that high conductivity. Kalium means potassium. The green lines <coughs> are the highest in potassium, so that's one of the reasons the, the conductivity was really high. And the red one is really low in potassium. The normal, normal uh, potato crop needs about four, four and a half thousand ppm of potassium for normal growth. Above 8,000 is excessive. Below 3,000 is too short. If we then look to the magnesium uh, numbers of the same, same crops, of the same uh, samples, you see the, the one with the low potassium is highest in magnesium. That was the only grower who applied um, Epsom salts. Every time he has to, uh, he sprayed the crop, he added some Epsom salts. So he was high in magnesium all the way, constantly. So by applying high magnesium, in his plants, he constantly throw out, threw out his potassium. It's again the balance. If one is high, the other will be low. And they're all in, in the same part, the same soil type. So, And if you look to the magnesium numbers of uh, the green grower, which was really high in the potassium, he has a lack of magnesium constantly constantly below 500, and that's really too low. So if you look at the test, the soil test, of the, the SEP test, um, the results, the green one is high in potassium, but low in magnesium, and low in calcium. So the high potassium puts out, of knocks out the calcium and the magnesium uptake. So the plant is building a, a lot of plant, but no structure in it. The red one was really low in potassium due to the high magnesium applications, which was excessive in magnesium. So it's, um, if you have too low potassium in your potato crop, it will uh, give you problems with your quality of firmness of the, the potato. And he also had more blue spots. I don't know the translation in, in, uh, in English, um, but it gives those blue spots on, uh, on, on the outside of the, the potatoes. That's a quality problem. It's a lack of potassium in this, uh, in this map. This one didn't have a good crop. This one neither. You have to be balanced in the middle. That's when all nutrients, uh, when the balance is, 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 is equal. That's when you have maximum production and the best quality. So I'm a bit early. So I have some time for extra questions. Yes, please. Um, you, you mentioned balance. Um, two, two questions. One is, you, you don't literally mean equal. It, it's 
not the levels are equal, but it's the uh, – I'll, I'll first repeat the question. Um, uh, you said uh, the balance uh, needs to be uh, – it needs to be in balance. That doesn't mean that the numbers uh, mean uh, has to be the same exactly. But um, for example, if you look at this this sample, potassium is like in numbers like 7,000. Uh, Four to five thousand is normal. And magnesium is is is, is really other numbers. And other uh, strawberry of a, a potato doesn't take up 5,000 ppm of, uh, of of magnesium. So it's, at the end, it's the, the bars, the length of the bars should be on the right at the same height. That's the balance I mean. So it's not exactly the numbers which have to be the same, but the, the judgment, uh, the, the length of the, the bar, that shows if you are in balance or not. Yeah. And, and just related to that, do you find major differences between different crops? Yes. Yeah. For example, a pepper cup uh, takes up, if you have a, a good calcium uptake, it will be in numbers like 50 to 100 ppms. If we have a tomato crop, it can be 2, 3, 4, 5,000 ppms of calcium. So that's totally different. But the, the balance between potassium and, and, and the ratio between potassium and calcium, that's also different for every crop, but that's determining if you have enough calcium or not at the end. Um, in an ideal, uh, the, the, he asks uh, if, if you have a healthy soil, uh, can it deliver uh, all nutrients, all cations and anions uh, for entire season in the right amounts? Yes? Yeah. Something like that? <laughs> um, yes, it can in an ideal situation. And then it, I mean really ideal. So, and then still uh, you're depending on uh, weather, on uh, quality of plants, uh, sunlight, all those things. And we've, we've never seen an ideal situation. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's, the, that's in practice. I can, can, can tell you that it's possible and we've never seen it. And you have, for example, a, a, a pepper crop, uh, sweet peppers, has a, a certain time it has uh, three uh, peppers on it, for example. And it will deliver those three before it makes three new ones. So you get, you have potassium needs go like up and down, up and down. And your soil will deliver it on an equal level if it's a healthy soil. So the peak and the, um, the, 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 on the, the other side, you have to adjust with, of you, it's best to adjust them uh, a bit. Then you have maximum production. And I think that's what you want to achieve, production and quality. So. But another thing we see, if your soil is not balanced at all, you have to um, adjust far, far more, uh, far more applications and higher applications throughout the season. You have to correct uh, more and off, more often as well. So. Yes. Just pressing. And, and what do you use to press with? Uh, a giant press. <laughs> yeah, we've developed uh, the press, uh, so we can do it on, uh, in our lab. Uh, very fast and very accurate. Because if you do it uh, just with a, with a grip, then I will do it differently than you will do it. And the first drop will be different than the last drop. So that's a bit of uh, a thing we have standardized, and that's why we get good numbers throughout the season. And, um, but that was one of the reasons we did it on the lab scale. Do you yeah. find there's a specific pressure, like hydraulically, that, that is ideal? Uh, there is, but it's for every crop of a type of leaf is different. Because uh, we do in nursery stock, so that's the trees, oak trees. <laughs> you need to press them far more harder than you need uh, cucumber, which you can actually squeeze like, like this with your hands. Huh? So we've standardized it, and, uh, and that's a bit of our, uh, our secret, <laughs> uh, to do it uh, to get stable numbers, because that's really important. Uh, how do you standardize that for 
Yes, we we don't um, take that. He asks, uh, how do we take uh, care of um, when the leaves are uh, full of moisture or dry out? If a plant dries out, you can do everything with minerals. It just needs water at that moment. So first give water to let the plant grow. And that's also the reason why we say take your samples in the morning when the leaf is on full tension, and then you have the best... Uh, the best numbers. So, yes. Um, the question is if we uh, always do leaves without the petioles or also do petiole analysis as well. We started with petioles because we, already, we also started as, as, as you guys in the field with pressing with a grip and then you need petioles because you can't get any juice out of the leaves or it's harder to do. But we, see, we saw that the, especially magnesium levels and, and the uh, trace elements are, are more accurate to measure in the leaf than in the petiole because the petiole is just, is just a highway towards the leaf and your deficiency will show in the leaf and not in the petiole. Or the axis. So that's why we start measuring the leaves, and it gives better numbers, uh, more accurate. So, yes. If you're getting mildew on your grapes, and some of the uh, things you do is spray copper on the on grape, if you put sulfur at that point, uh, is that going to help? <coughs> Yes. Um, the, the question was if a, a grape crop um, has a mildew pressure and you start spraying copper to reduce it, uh, should, you, should you also apply sulfur? Well, sulfur, sulfur is an element which is important for uh, resistance against uh, f uh, fungi, fungal diseases. Um, but if you put, for example, copper or sulfur on the leaves, then it's just a, a pesticide which you, which you can call a nutrient. And which can be sold as a, as a fertilizer instead of a, instead of a pesticide. But if you are able to manage the uptake from, from, through the roots, and so the plant, uh, the, the numbers in the plant will be raised, then the resistance will be bigger or better in, from the plant itself. Uh, mildew in grapes is also a matter of uh, keeping nitrates low. Say something. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say something. Um, Johan's not tooting his own horn, and uh, I'm Arden Anderson. For those who don't know, and I'm the one who got Johan here. I've been over there a couple years, and the one thing that I want you to understand is that these guys have done over 300,000 samples over the past what number of years? Four years. Over the past four years. And the one thing that they have done, which is way beyond tissue analysis, is that they have absolutely been able to correlate nutrient levels using SEP testing to diseases and insects. You cannot say that about standard soil testing. You cannot say that about standard tissue testing. Not only that, what they have shown is, is that this SAP testing runs about a week to two weeks in advance of anything that you'll see in tissue testing. So the bottom line is, is that this testing system, and I don't get any uh, thing from them as far as royalty or anything like that, so, but he's not, he's not tooting his own horn on this. The bottom line is, is that this testing system that they have developed, we are able to actually solve insect and disease problems with the nutrition that has been talked about for years and years and years at Acres, but always the question comes up, how do I prove that? How do I document that this is the nutrient I need to apply in order to solve this problem? This is what this testing system is doing and has been doing. So, Johan, I wanted to toot your horn a little bit because you're not oh, really you. saying what's going on. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll be uh, available this afternoon in one of the um, consulting halls for more further questions. I think it's 12 o'clock already, so we had to... Uh... Thank you.